Hi, Tony here again from all the remote things, and I'm with Nigel Thurlow. How are you in your evening, Nigel? Uh, yeah, it is my evening, Tony. It's great. And if we do if we have a really good conversation, maybe I'll stay awake long enough since it's my evening here. Well, that's a litmus test for me. So if anybody sees you going on the nod, they know my interviewing capability is not real great. So <laughs> now I'm under the pump. Look, as we do, Nigel, would you like to just give everybody your, your bio, give you an intro of where you're from? And yeah, I'm, well, I'm a Brit living in Texas in the, in North America, hence the time zone I'm in this evening. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of a bit of a troublemaker, sort of outspoken, sarcastic Brit that used to work for a certain car company that is makes very reliable Japanese automobiles. Uh, and so I did a little bit with this thing called Lean and the Toyota production system. Oh, they gave the name away. Oh, dear. And uh, so, uh, <laughs> so um, but then I, I sort of stumbled across this thing called Scrum and this world of Agile some years ago, hung out with the creators of Scrum for a while, uh, was fortunate enough to take the concept into Toyota and be the, the sort of key catalyst inside Toyota globally for driving their interest in agile sort of ideas and practices, combining those with their practices from the Toyota world and coming up with something called Scrum the Toyota Way, which sort of resonated for a while. It wasn't a, a you know an either or, it was an and. So we brought that together. And then from that, my work's driven to this thing behind me. We probably will chat about later called the flow system, or at least the constructs of flow and the ideas behind what we might mean by flow now and some of the nonsense that's perpetuating out there about flow currently you know watch out folks here comes the next nonsense framework Tony. <laughs> brilliant brilliant well that that, that that is actually why I, I look to get you on the on the uh, cast is because you know the flow system and you know you, you i see a lot of organizations saying saying that they want to base themselves around flow but I think it's that old meme that you see out there is I don't think you know what that mean, that word actually means when you say flow. So I think that's a, a, a good segue into you've written a book around it. Um, yeah. We'll, we'll dig a bit deeper into that. How, how did you get there? How did you get to the flow system? What's the background before we get deep into that? So I'll step back. At, I'll go back way back in time. Well, at least some to back in time for some listeners back into maybe the, the 90s or so. And I was this really good project manager, apparently, and I was doing my Prince 2 project management, which is similar to PMP for the folks on my side of the pond nowadays. Um, and I was doing this sort of, I'd gone through the becoming a technical engineer and a technical manager and then found that project management seemed fun and they paid me a little bit more money. So I, had, I started to understand all these elements of project management. And I thought I was really, really good. And then I got hired by Comcast, which is a US uh, telco company, uh, and they hired me into Europe. So moved me over to Belgium for some years. And and uh, I sort of started to enjoy the telco world. And then the big telco crash came in around 2002, 2003. And then I was looking for a job. And I was out there on the consulting market because Comcast had pulled out of Europe in the middle of the, the telco crash. So I found myself wanting for a position and this certain automotive company, this Japanese, uh, these Japanese uh, folks, Toyota said, hey, we, we're looking for a project manager in enterprise architecture. So would you like to come and do that job? And so I joined Toyota, knowing nothing about lean, really, other than what I'd read in books and lots of the books by the late, great Norman Bodek. Um, and I joined Toyota and for the first six months, I used to resign every day. I spent every day I'd go home thinking these people were absolutely stark staring mad, had no idea how to run anything. Like, here was me. I had been in the industry for many years. I was an IT guy and good project manager. And these folks didn't know how to project manage themselves out of wet paper back. However, suddenly... I had this catharsis and when it happened, I don't exactly remember, probably around the six month mark, I suddenly the penny dropped and I suddenly got it. I suddenly understood the Toyota way, the Toyota mindset, the Toyota way of working and the Toyota production system. Then the next five years is, and I describe this, I think it's even on my LinkedIn profile, as the best professional training of my entire career. And I was actually paid to be a member in deep immersion in the Toyota production system. I then met my wife and moved to America. So I left my Toyota career behind in, in Belgium, where I was living at the time, 
moved to the States and found these folks that did this sort of agile thing, you know, these the Messrs. Sutherland and Schwaber, ended nice. up working alongside them, which was great fun for a period of time. And I know, Tony, you've worked with some of the, the manifesto folks in your background <laughs> and probably still do. And uh, so I met these folks, hung around for a while and thought, OK, this is vaguely Toyota-ish. And the way I bumped into them is I actually was doing some work for the state of Massachusetts and uh, they were asking me to help them coach them in sort of, you know, bridging the lean and the agile world. And they were taking training off Jeff Sutherland and sort of said, hey, would you go along and listen to what he's teaching us? Because hey, he's one of the creators here. And so as I did, and then and I was in one of his product owner classes just as an observer. And he came across to me and people may not know this, but a lot of the agile movement has been heavily influenced by Toyota over the years. Specifically, the people who created Scrum have been deeply influenced by TPS. Yes. And in fact, Schwaber, Ken Schwaber will tell you that TPS and the uh, empirical approaches from DuPont were the influences behind Scrum. Jeff may tell a slightly different version of that, but Toyota is definitely one of the key influences. And so Jeff happened to note that I was in the room and he came and asked me about Toyota and about A3 thinking, A3 problem solving, which he taught us at a very lightweight overview of in the class, asked me if I would lead that particular session, ended up leading that session. And that started a relationship that lasted for the next few years with me getting heavily involved in the agile world. But at the same time, the Toyota world was still there. And they picked up the phone one day and called Jeff's office and said, hey, we're interested in this scrum thing. And because I knew the people because of my background in Toyota in Europe, long story short, got engaged with them, got involved with them, started working uh, in depth with them and then ended up moving and becoming a Toyota team member again and, and taking up my chief of agile role there. So what does all this have to do with the flow system? So I'd studied things that have been happening over the years. I'd studied the Toyota way of doing things, how TPS and this lean thinking really work within Toyota. And I'd studied, you know, problem solving and root cause analysis and many, many tools to help us to solve challenges in organizations. And I'd seen the way they'd operated in this very disciplined, very standardized, repeatable way. Then, of course, I'd had experience with a number of large organizations, GE and 3M and some others in my agile sort of journey and started to see the benefits of this different way of approaching things, this different way of approaching project initiatives product development. But all the time I was thinking something's missing. And, and when I got to Toyota, I started to bring these worlds together with the Scrum the Toyota way idea and concept. I started to think, okay, so I can see all these pieces working in isolation, but there's something not quite right. This time I'd started collaborating with the University of North Texas and with who is now my one of my co-authors and the key co-author really, Professor John Turner from UNT. That's why his name's at the top of the list on the book, because he is the, the, the clever one. Um, and I started to talk with John and involve him in some of the things we were doing. And it started to dawn on me that actually, it, it, just like we look at lean and agile as separate things, they weren't separate things. And as I started to look at this, we'd gone deep into Dave Snowden's world and Kenevin and complexity theory and a lot of work, a lot of collaboration with Dave. Indeed, I brought him into Toyota in the early days to do some, uh, some training there. But then I was very much focused on leadership and empowerment because, of course, within Toyota, the, the shop floor is a really empowered environment. There's some idiosyncrasies in Japanese leadership, but certainly it's empowerment on the, on the shop floor. And then what John brought along as well, in addition to his distributed leadership level of knowledge, he brought in the team science ex, uh, aspects and also the elements of team working. And then, of course, Ponch, who's the third author on the book, Brian Rivera, he'd been working with me both at uh, within the Scrum world, but also at Toyota. And he brought in some of his military aviation team theories, crew concepts, a lot of the work he'd done as a, as a sort of a, a F-14 pilot. But what I was still finding was everything was isolated. You could buy books on leadership. You could dig deep into complexity thinking and lose yourself for years. And you could build all this. You could buy some of these books on like team building, but not really anything, which I would really suggest went into team science deeply. And I was musing with this and drawing houses. You know, this thing behind me is 
looks like a house yeah. or some people say a temple, yeah? yeah? And I was musing with this. Now, originally, the first drawing of this came up with agility as one of, was a pillar of it originally, and then leadership and some other stuff. And then suddenly it dawned on me, there weren't pillars. It wasn't these isolated elements and aspects. It was this interconnected, intertwined nature of these different things. And actually, agility was an emergent property of the way we work, the way we act, the way we behave towards each other and towards the work. And actually, what was missing was complexity thinking, truly understanding complex problems. My whole world in Toyota had been understanding problems in what's more ordered in the predictable world, but not in this sort of unordered messy chaotic unpredictable world and so i started to move the toyota thinking to the uh, to the base which is where it lives now and become our foundation and then to build on that and to start looking at how we interconnected complexity thinking distributed leadership and team science together and that and i just drew three lines and one of my uh, team members at the time walked by and he looked at me and says i love your triple helix and that was where the idea, it was really just a friend of mine, you know, one of the, my team members at the time, Dan Ofchenik, I'll give him a shout out, Dan, uh, who said that. And that's where it stuck. And it suddenly then became obvious what was missing was the interconnected, interrelated nature. And the fact that all these frameworks out there are very uh, one size he fits all, assuming a single context. And what we needed was something that didn't was 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 free to operate in any context, but would adapt and change and be adaptive in different contexts. Yes. So what we created was a system of learning and understanding in a context free environment, which is both its strength and alas, its weakness because of the passion for prescriptions and methodologies. That was a big, long answer, Tony. Oh, it's a good one. Though. And I think you were a bit harsh on yourself about saying it's a weakness in the prescriptions. It's a weakness in the people thinking around the way of yeah. working that allows yeah. them to have a weakness. Because I, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with you. And, and you know, we were we were chatting around certain prescriptive frameworks. And and and, and the reality of it is, is even in the, the remote agility framework. That one of our major key factors there is you design for the context of the organisation. Yes, the, the organics of the, an organisation are completely different whether it be to add or it be a bank, it'd be a, an insurance. It's that, it's that complexity that, that, that finds itself through and winds itself through. And then you add in that kind of leadership mechanisms around that. You've got traditional versus, you know, you know, you end up with these three speed economies all over the place where you, you, your fastest leg might be agility because they've spent a lot of time building this fantastic delivery engine, but we haven't thought about the complexity of how that works with the, the governing of the system as a whole therefore we end up in in problem you know, dave snowden has a word he says calls it universality well i mean it's a word that's in the dictionary but universality and he says that people are trying to portray frameworks and tools and methods as, as this giant universal one size fits all thing and there is no universality there's that concept we've talked about in previous calls i've had with different people about bounded applicability which means that all tools a pen has a utility. Hey, you know, a microphone has utility, but they have a limit to their utility. They're designed for a certain contextual use. And the same applies when you, if you're a diet, if you're doing deep sea diving or doing oil rig repairs under the waterline, that's a very different context than if you're in an emergency room or you're flying a plane or writing software or servicing a car. Now, all tools have value. And where some of the, the large prescriptive frameworks have fallen down, they've just sort of vomited all these tools on a giant landscape and gone, here's this universal framework that will solve everything. But what it fails to do is, number one, it doesn't address the organizational design. It doesn't address how the leadership function and operate. And it basically vomits a bunch of tools on a canvas and says, here's all the tools you'll ever possibly need. Go to it. The challenge is, of course, that I've been known to say that I don't believe in lean thinking. There are any tools. I think there are only behaviors. And I think all the things that they describe as a lean tool is actually a behavior. And I think that, you know, from an agile point of view, agile, the agile, agile manifesto is wonderful. So it's a philosophy. We can choose to align to it. We can choose to adapt our behaviors to to sort of support some of the values and principles in it. But the whole concept of agility is emergent. 
And the way we apply tools and thinking is contextual within the organizations we're in. And therefore, trying to just sort of provide a template and say, follow this, just is never going to be effective. And that's what I was trying to get away from. Yeah, and I, and I think when I read it, it really struck me that there's, there's two things that you, you talk about. Um, agility is emergent, and, and that is so true, because as you as you look at the construct of your organization in the right context, then agility does become emergent, right? If, if not, where I see a problem with these, you know, for want of saying any other word, cookie cutter uh, <laughs> uh, processes and frameworks that they put in place is what they then do is try to change the construct of the organization to satisfy the landscape of the page that you were just talking about, yes. rather than actually looking at the construct of the organisation in its its um, totality, or and look at how do we create flow, and then for what are the things that we need then to enable us to do so. Yeah, and I'm already starting to see, and and I I gave a talk in in the Netherlands about three four weeks ago at a conference, and I was airing some new material, which is basically telling people all the things that flow is not because it's not a manifesto, it's not a methodology, it's not a framework, it's not a prescription, and it definitely isn't an annual certification fee. Uh, and what we're finding is that these things are starting to emerge already as the, the, the large consulting groups are finding that their big size fit frameworks are looking for the next big thing. So flow seems to be it. And unfortunately, you know, they're missing the point that flow is a construct it's not uh, any of the things I mentioned previously, but I can so I, can, I only wait for the Flowmaster certification to come out. You know, and all this nonsense. I've actually so, heard someone call himself a Flowmaster once before, and yeah, yeah it just it, it it didn't do me any favors at the time. I'll I'll have to we'll just we'll, we'll just leave it with that. <laughs> yeah, let's move on. <laughs> and I think I think that you know that's what we were, you know we were having that chat. And I was saying to you that it goes back to that meme, right? And that meme is is literally for me is that I think you know I, the word flow. I don't think you know what that means when you use that. Right? So mm -hmm. and I, what I would what I would say to people if you haven't read this book, have, have a read of it because it, the the one thing I really like, um, Nigel, in that is is that you have done something that I've seen for a very long time people struggle with and you've managed to merge agile and lean and ha how the two work together because I, I can tell you now having worked in different organizations the very first question you get is well how does lean work with agile how does agile work with lean what's the difference between the two right and and that's that's a that's something that i think is is not been well presented i'm going to comment on that because um a couple of things that that I, I when I talk to a lot of agile practitioners, and there's a lot of really good agile practitioners out there, don't think I'm uh, knocking them, and I certainly aren't. But there are a lot of people who got the certificates, read the manual, you know, the 16 or 14 page guide, <laughs> uh, probably read, read the horrific, you know, bastardized version of the, the scrum bock or whatever the hell they call that nowadays, which is the 700 page version of a 14 page guide so please don't read that folks just ignore it read the 14 page guide i mean not the other one um but what i find is a lot of people who are preaching the agile mindset stuff and the, the the lean thinking and they describe themselves as lean agile blah 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 coach or soon it'll be lean agile flow coach or something like this they lack a basic grasp of the lean fundamentals. They've never actually worked in a organization, a lean organization, or they've never took the time to understand those fundamental roots of it. And if you actually look at one, I mean, uh, my thinking is becoming more simplified as I get older, maybe because I'm losing my gray cells, but I'm starting to simplify the thinking because if you take the fundamental lean concept of a value stream, and there's lots of different words for it. And even these people now trying to come up with the value stream consortium and these value stream management folks, and it's just nonsense, yeah? And it, they're sort of saying, well, they, they're just isolating it to a digital value stream as opposed to the sort of end-to-end -end value stream. So if you take any organizational context, any organizational structure that delivers products and services or something somebody perceives as value, and then there's a way we get from the concept or the customer request to the delivery of the value, the cash, where they pay us money. And there's a bunch of things happening in the middle. Well, that's all a value stream is. But when you actually start to look at an organization, you start to find there are 
significant constraints within the organization to delivering value. Now, going and slamming a bunch of folks doing agile somewhere in one of the tech teams somewhere along that, that value stream is a suboptimization, as Deming used to say back in the day. And isn't, you know, there's nothing wrong with the techniques, but there's a suboptimization because what you've actually got is this end to end value stream, which has all these different constraints in these discrete departments like procurement, vendor management, legal, finance, you know, and then you've got compliance and governance and all these other processes that we have to navigate to deliver value well i've started talking about this concept now of devops at an as an enterprise concept so people are all talking about value streams as a digital thing so i thought well i'll take the digital thing the devops thing and now talk about it as an enterprise thing because if you want to optimize how you deliver value and services you need to eliminate the constraints in the system and optimize the flow across the value stream and then if you want to create space for innovation and creativity, go and eliminate the waste in the system. This is basic lean thinking. And so I've started, I've said quite often, if you want to be agile, first get lean. Because if you can eliminate these constraints to delivery, you create the space for rapid decision making, rapid execution, that's business agility, and innovation and creativity, which puts you into that disruptive innovator space, the Teslas and SpaceXs of this world, where a lot of people want to move into that space. And so that's some of the narrative of use, but it, it does pain me that a lot of the education out there for the agile practitioners is just missing some of this fundamental knowledge and learning. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, I see that regularly. I call it the rise of the rise of the $10 coach, but let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> but also the other thing, I, I like the, the thought around DevOps. Um, often when I'm talking to organizations and, and the first thing they say is, oh, we've got a DevOps team. I say, no, you have a bottle there. Right. <laughs> exactly. so, so literally, if you, DevOps is something that should permeate everything that you do or everything that your teams do. Yes. You have a DevOps team that, that supports some of the platforms, but if you have a DevOps team, you have a massive bottle there. Look, we could we could keep going with this forever, but I'm gonna. Yeah, I know we could. Yeah, we could bury <laughs> ourselves. I, I do really want to talk about because you're so much more than just the flow. Um, but people, really, if you want to see see flow described the best way I've ever seen it, and I'm not just saying that for fun because John's here, um, Nigel's here. Sorry, um, go and have a, a read of it. Yeah. So you know, there's John Turner, Nigel Thurlow, and Brian Rivera on that, and and all of them are, are brilliant people who put together this in a fantastic way. All right, let's take a little step to the right. Sure. And there's another book that I know that you were involved in, and I know that you've been involved in this work quite a bit as well. So that's uh, the, the lovely Kneffen um, and weaving the sense making into the fabric of our world. Talk to me a little bit about that. And, and <laughs> while we're at it, it still sort of harks to your flow anyway, because I know that the, the complexity thinking, which is on the wall behind you, the Kneffen is, is wound into what you're thinking anyway. Yeah, so Kenevin was coming up, and it's Kenevin. I'll just try and help you with because of Dave. It's a verse sound like <laughs> Kevin Kenevin. Um, took me years, trust me. It's like the guy who wrote the book on psychological flow, Mihai Chiksen Mihai. That took me a lot of practice, so I just use that whenever I can. But no, let's back to Kenevin. So it's coming up to Kenevin's twenty-first birthday, I believe, was the the significance of that. And, and the gang behind Dave's company and, and, and including his wife and daughter and the, the whole family were in on this secret. So how we managed to do it, the, 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 the people behind the scenes here. So when Sonia was involved with Dave and a bunch of other folks, they conspired to get a bunch of authors, very, very, uh, uh, you know, austere collection of, you know, amazing collection of authors, very, very talented people together to write Kenevin based chapters, stories, anecdotes, things that resonated in the Kenevin world and to bring this collection of stories together. And in fact, one of the, the chapters I would highly recommend, there's a whole section about diabetes. Uh, one of the authors wrote in that in the book then, if I could remember the name, I'd flick through the book about it next to me and tell you, but there are some fantastic stories about complexity, complexity thinking, and where can Nevin fit? How can Nevin works as a sense making framework and how we make sense of the world in which we live, which is what sense making is to sort of paraphrase what Dave would say. And so we all got together 
Uh, now, you mentioned John Turner, and I'm going to give him kudos here because he's a real professor at uh, University of North Texas, and uh, he's been my, without him, that book you mentioned, the Flow System book, would never have been born. Our collaboration on the Kenevin book was, you know, only possible because I've got something like John helping me as a as a deeply clever guy and a brilliant writer. He can churn out word count at an insanely fast rate. So together we're able to write a great contribution, something I enjoyed immensely doing and be a contributor to that book. There are many other pieces in the book which are better, in my opinion, far better. And But it was just a great privilege to be part of a landmark book. It sold huge quantities and still is selling. It's still extremely popular. The artwork in the book is absolutely fantastic. It was all hand drawn and the book is designed in a very clever way. So you can open the book at any part and drop into any chapter. Yeah. And then there are symbols which guide you into other parts of the book on different journeys you may want to follow through the book. So unlike most books where you start at the beginning and finish at the end, you can actually take a journey and that may be a little bit, I mean, this this a lot of influences in Dave's life, like, you know, Tolkien and, and, and you know, the, the authors of Alice in Wonderland and even Winnie the Pooh, for goodness sake. So there's all these famous authors that have influenced Dave's thinking. And so the book was sort of, a, it was sort of built in a way that it could be navigable as a different journey of discovery for every reader. And, and it's a really, really cool book. I've got two copies. One I bought and one Dave sent me, he signed to me. So that one stays on the shelf. The other one I, I enjoyed delving into. So, yeah, it was it was a great thing to be part of. And I'm very proud we were part of that and very pleased that we it became part of what it was. Yeah, it's good. And and the reason I brought it up, uh, not just because you, you'd be part of it, but it, it, for me, I think the reason it's been successful or the reason I, I, I do say to people, if you want to understand Ken Evan, better is, is what it actually does is it it puts real world examples yeah and and i think you know one of ken evans weaknesses and i would say that today is, is it takes a lot for people to understand where that fits into the real world if they just for me it's really easy tony it's really easy get get the picture of ken evan put a line down the middle you know, I mean, dave will kill me for saying this <laughs> he'll, he'll say me so it it always stuff. makes me laugh when they, they see the five domains and they describe it as four quadrants. So there are five pieces to Kenevin, key pieces, and there are three ontological states. Now, let's put all those fancy words out of the way because, you know, it's me you're talking to. So uh, if you look at Kenevin, as you're looking at Kenevin, on the right-hand side, you've got the predictable world, the ordered world. It's linear, predictable, understandable, ordered. And that's where Toyota fits. That's where lean fits. So lean thinking or any predicted, sorry, any prescribed methodologies fit there. Five Y analysis fits there. And traditional project management, uh, operational excellence, all fits on that side of Kenevin. On the other side of Kenevin, now we're looking at the left-hand side, that's the unpredictable, unordered, sort of non-linear world. And those tools from the right don't work there. And on that side, we use things like narratives and storytelling and, and sense making, some of the new techniques which people should start to look into and learn and study. And sort of in the middle, there's this sort of little band in the middle that sort of curves between the ordered and the unordered world and sort of swings down into the chaos the, the, the sort of state of chaos, which is really where everything's gone horribly wrong. And that's where your agile thinking, your, your agile and scrum thinking fits in this transitional area between the two. So what scrum helps us to do is to manage as we move from a less predictable world into a more unpredictable world and enables us through using some of the empirical experiments, which they're always favorites of, you know, the scrum practitioners to talk about. Most of scrum isn't empirical, by the way but it is an empirical model. So it helps us to navigate that world. And as Dave even said recently, it helps us through doing multiple parallel experiments to bring ourselves out of the unordered world back into the managed and ordered world. And that's that's sort of the one of the benefits of the, the sort of agile ways of thinking and some of the, if you use Scrum as it was originally designed for lots of experiments, and bring things into the ordered world. So really, Kenevin's just helping you make sense of where you are. Are we in this 
this linear ordered predictable world and it's split into two the the easy stuff the the clear zone which is where best practices horrible phrase but current best practices work you've got the sort of area where expertise and multiple heads are needed on a problem but we're still in the predictable world and then over on the other side it starts to help us identify if we're in this very entangled world where our traditional ways of working won't function for us or hell are we actually in chaos and for those that just think i've missed it there's a bit in the middle which says you're in complete a state of aporia which is an unresolvable state of confusion which is where a lot of us start where we're trying to figure out where we are so actually when we look and the analogy i use i stick a picture on my presentations on one side of the toyota production system production line that's the ordered world on the other side i put the game of rugby which is pretty <laughs> universal to most people because trust me there's these defined roles and defined positions and defined plays but the minute the whistle blows you're in a complex situation so that's really all can Evan is i hope that may help somebody yeah Thank that's that, that's that's a really nice brilliant way to put it so i think that was great um that lets us move forward a little bit further into the, the final thing I really want to talk to you because we are getting close to the time. But sure. I can't let you go without you set me a challenge. Right? When I said I wanted to interview you, you set me a challenge. Challenge accepted. Uh, I, I do believe there was a dinner attached to it, but we'll, we'll get to that. And it, it was to read a paper that you, you sent me, which was Substrate Theory, which, by the way, anybody, you can find that at substratetheory.com if you'd like to, to read through it. I did read through it. Now we're going to chat around it. <laughs> so having been uh, reading it and I looked at it and I understood it as, as you're trying to do, my understanding of it is, is that it's, it's you're trying to describe how you might take using that substrate theory, the way to actually scaffold and think about how you might use Kinefa within an organisation, right? That's my impression of it. But I'm, going, I'm talking to the author. <laughs> so please. Feel free to fill me in a little bit more on substrate. So theory. It's the substrate independence theory. However, right. when we wrote the paper, we found so many people wanted to look at it. I just put up a domain name, substratetheory.com, to drive them to the to the journal, the systems journal where it's published. I have to say it's the biggest, uh, it's not selling because we don't sell anything, but it's the biggest or most popular downloaded paper in the journal's history as far as we're aware, which is insane. It took Dave, myself, so Dave Snowden, myself, John Turner, Professor Turner, worked on this for a number of months. It's about 35,000 words. It's a lot of pages. It went through the peer review process. The first time I proofread it as an author, it took me six hours. And that was somebody who'd been involved in the authoring of it. Um, but basically what we wanted to do, we wanted to sort of look at some of the different things we'd been working on, bring some of these different things together. Now, the theory we're working on, we're sort of concerned with social systems capable of learning, self-organizing and adapting to their environment. So they're words that should resonate with practitioners in some of the dark arts in this agile world that we we practice. Now, we talk about complex adaptive systems. If anybody listening wants to know what a complex adaptive system is, look in the mirror and the reflection that you see is a complex adaptive system. That's you. Okay. These are systems that are not predictable, not linear, not ordered. This is way into the other side of the Kinevin diagram. And we, with complex adaptive systems, they can adapt through emergent processes and they result in the systems repurposing themselves into new coherent structures to, to, sorry, to sustain their fitness. So that's a simple explanation of what it is. Now, the substrate independence refers to the information being the underlying property of a host system. And that's the bit that's really got me excited because we're talking about information and we're talking about the flow of information. Now, we do get into a lot of other topics like scaffolding, which focuses on the flow of information through a system rather than concentrating on some perceived goal or outcome. And so scaffolding in this respect is the cognitive version of a constraint or lack of control. And scaffolding provides an enabling constraint. So an inhibiting constraint is a cons is a rule. Don't do speed limits. That's our thing. It's the things you are not allowed to do. Where an enabling constraint is a type of 
set of guardrails. If you like that, I usually, always use the bowling alley men, uh, me, uh, metaphor. When you take kids to, to the bowling alley, 10 pin bowling, you put up these side barriers so that the ball doesn't drop in the gully because otherwise every time they threw the ball, it would be very disheartening for young players learning the game. So we create this enabling constraint so the ball can move freely on the on the alleyway within that sort of those constraints we provided. So in the business context, Enabling constraints are saying to the agents in the system, the people, the machines, the technology, you can do whatever you want within these constraints, within these guardrails. We give them freedom to function. So scaffolding can provide an enabling constraint. Now, Dave did call me out on this recently, so I'm going to make sure I get it right this time. So traditionally, scaffolding is seen as a temporary structure, which you can assemble to help a system achieve some sort of outcome, if you like. So you may see Scrum as an enabling constraint, sorry, as a temporary scaffold for a team that's learning to operate in a certain standardized, repeatable way. And for me, Scrum is PDCA with, you know, some, some enabling constraints like a product owner, a Scrum master, and yeah. some time boxed events, but it's still right. PDCA in its, in its, its basic format. And so eventually the scaffold can fall away, be removed, and the, the, the organizational unit doesn't require the scaffolding anymore to function. But Dave did remind me that some scaffolds are permanent, like your skeleton, because he said, if I took your skeleton away, you'd just be a pile <laughs> of mush. So you've got endo and exoskeletons, but, but mainly we're concerned with using scaffolding as a way to enable some outcomes or some sort of uh, system sort of performance. But the information stuff has really, really got me very, very excited um, because we start looking at information and the flow of information because we started to, to do some of the reading of the literature. And of course, it's all in the paper and the cited links are in the paper because information is the precursor to life. So once life is established, it has the information carriers and exec executor mechanisms that are selected for increasing, preserving, or, you know, preserving the likelihood of their own persistence. And that comes from some of the work that's out there in information theory, and that's been around for yeah. some time. Right. So we've started to look at the fact that energy follows information. And at a very simple level, within a system, most systems are concerned with the exchange of information whether that's information to aid manufacturing, information to aid knowledge work, information. Hell, we're exchanging information here verbally in a video call. And so the, the, there's some concepts of logical depth, which is the cost of being able to get at that information. So information depth or the information value is defined as providing actionable information. So we're in this sort of, in the world of sort of big data, we're in the world of, digitization we're in the world of just you know petabytes of data being generated continuously but the more time and energy needed to obtain information the deeper the path to that information so logical depth refers to the cost of obtaining that information and so the the, the statement that energy follows information as we start to increase the cost of getting or the logical depth of getting to that information, we increase the energy cost for getting to that information. So what we're trying to do, and this is where you start to come back to lean thinking, you start to come back to some of the basic fundamental principles, is to remove the constraints to allow us to improve the flow of information in organizations, in society, in the work we do. Now, this is just one part of the paper, but it's something that I latched on to, and, and I'll give full, full credit to, to Professor Turner for bringing this piece out, because this then segues into a lot of what we're talking about when we get into uh, const uh, constructor theory, which is the work of Deutsch and Mar Marletto, uh, sort of papers they they bought out in 2013-15, excuse me, bringing out some new theories in physics. And this sort of brings in how we, we start to look at counterfactuals. So we consider all the things that are not possible, not just the things that are possible. We also start to look at how Kenevin fits 
and in the substrate independence theory the paper we wrote we we start to look at the environmental states through the three ontological states i mentioned them earlier the ordered domain the complex domain uh, sorry the ordered state the complex state and the chaotic state so we start to bring these different things together and then start to propose a new theory for how organizations might be able to manage more effectively in complex situations. We do address the theory of constraints. We talk about where Goldratt was with the theory of constraints, and we start to talk about using the concept of scaffolds uh, instead of constraints. And indeed, Dave's done some work on that independently as well. Um, I don't know, Tony. I'm, I mean, I, there's 35,000 words of, yes, of, of yes. stuff here. We, I mean, I'm jumping around a bit to give a flavour of this. Yeah, I think, I think it's good that you've given a flavour because what I would say is anybody's interested, go and, and, and read the paper. What I would say from the point of the remote agility framework, I was just reflecting back on that. Yeah, we we're conversing is is that you know um, myself and another gentleman, Phil Kuczynski, and a couple of others, we came up with the remote pillars of governance within the actual. Um, framework itself and one of those pillars is information and not yes. mistaken, when i was reading this and as I, as I said reflecting back to you is is that that flow of information the other pillars which we define as transparency which you and i talked about um leadership and and work or systems of work systems in general all of those are underpinned by that information flow so what the, the thing you're latching onto in that flow of information is if, if we can increase that information flow, we can take the cost away, take the bottlenecks that allow that information to flow. Therefore, your transparency is then able to be done in, in a way that's that's usable. You can be transparent about those things that you need to. Leaders have the information they need to do to make the directional decisions. And the flow of work through your system itself actually becomes better because when you have information, information allows you to actually increase the flow of work. So it's interesting because we I moved away from using pillars because I wanted to show that there was not either or it was this integral and that's just my way of doing that. So these are not pillars behind me, they're helixes or helices, depending on your version of English. But so you're talking about the, the information. So scaffolding is a metaphor for how information and knowledge yeah. are absorbed and how learning is structured. So in education, scaffolding is viewed as a means of closing the gap between the learner's current knowledge to their desired knowledge, allowing them to perform a particular task activity independently, et cetera, which could not have been done uh, uh, previously. So scaffolding is defined as a temporary structure for supporting something until that something is able to stand on its own. So that's where that starts to fit in with it. I mean, as I say, I could talk about this till the, the cows come home. We don't have the time. But this is where we start to see scaffolding as a is being different from a framework that because a framework provides a structural form for items to be placed it, upon it and of course a, a framework is a basic structure on to, on which other things can be built which is why some of the things out there calling themselves framework just aren't frameworks at all Correct. we all know who we're talking about they're voldemort um so the, but the point is this that so we and we define some new types of some new types of uh, of scaffolds out there you know things like temporary permanent elastic dave's very proud of one he calls the dark constraint or the, the dark scaffold which comes from his work on dark constraints so th there's a few good things in there i mean it's not an easy read but it is it was designed because it was written as a paper that was peer reviewed it's designed to suggest some new theories some new ideas the advice i give to people approaching it Ignore the abstract, because that's all word gobbledygook that was written for, you know, indexing and other reasons on the journal. Then go through the sections in the paper. It's, it's beautifully sectioned out. John did a lot of work to chunk it, as it's called, apparently, in the, the writing world, to chunk it. So you've got sections which look at scaffolding, Kinevin, constructor theory, information theory, these different things. Then on their own, those stand as valuable chunks of information. And then as you get deeper into the paper, you start to get how we bring these together into what we call the substrate independence theory and how we use Kinevin and scaffolds in ways to enable organizations to function more effectively. What's happening now is we're doing some experiments in organizations. We're working with some of the we're actually 
testing these things empirically in organizations I'm working with one particularly. And of course, some of this will feed it. There's two more books coming this year. Uh, one of them later in the year is a collaboration with Dave Snowden. He's, he's already announced it once himself, so it's not a secret anymore. But we're collaborating with Dave. We were actually writing a book on decision making in complexity. And since John has just been and presented at a, uh, uh, a conference for clever people, basically a peer review type conference, we are introducing the concept of system three thinking. So you hear, you heard it here first. You've got system one, system two, thinking fast, thinking slow. So we're bringing, we're bringing out a theory of system three thinking, which is decision making in complexity. That book will probably come around the autumn or for the Americans, the fall of this year. Uh, and the precursor to that, we're bringing out the second book on the flow system, which is more the practitioner's guide, which is for the, uh, it's like the, like we take Kinevin and we, we make it easier for people to understand. We're taking the flow system and moving that firmly now into the hands of the people executing and showing them how to execute and how to use some of the ideas that we put in the first book and delivering those to the market. So there's a couple of things to look forward to. That second book is probably three months away from being available. That's fantastic. Look, we are very close to the end of our time. So, and we could, we could, we, I say this often to people that are on it, we could keep going, but we could we, to, uh, to give it an end. How, how can people get in touch with you if they've got questions, they read this thing or, or they want to actually have you come work with them sure well if they want to find me on linkedin i set up some domain names to make this easy follow nigel.com that will get you to linkedin <laughs> if you want to see my funniness on youtube watch nigel.com and if you want to get in touch with me to actually have a conversation over zoom meet nigel.com and that'll allow anybody free of charge to book a conversation with me and i talk to all sorts of people around the world whether it's professional whether it's for engagement purposes or just because they want a bit of advice or they just want to have a conversation about something interesting. So they're the three easy ways to find me. Yeah, and I'm living proof that he'll answer you back if you do that. So, uh, <laughs> look, absolutely fantastic, Hammond. If you're listening to this, don't forget, like, subscribe, and, of course, amplify. Don't forget to join our Remote AF community that we have now in place. You can just go to remoteaf.co uh, for all things remote as as uh the button is there you just click on it and then you can join us again it's been fantastic to have you on all the remote things nigel wonderful to have you what i will say is when you get the new book out my commitment is i'll have you back on because i think there's so many other things that we could chat about thank you so much thank you tony i really appreciate it